Okay, here we are. This is the Vanguard Circle of the Jewish Socialist Bund. And we are the reconstitution of the uh, Jewish Bund um, as it arose and operated and made revolutions in Eastern Europe and in Russia as uh, differentiated to a certain degree from the Jewish Labor Bund, which is um, found in chapters embedded in the Workers' Circle of the various uh, community centers that are found in all of the municipalities in which Jewish people are living in the West. Now, although I'm also reading at this time an English translation of a French publication called, uh, you can see it here, oh, here's the cover. There it is. Revolutionary Yiddish land. Now, Yiddish land was um, this uh, territorial ghetto that was set up by the Tsarist regime in which all the Jewish people were confined unless uh, they could be useful and allowed to go into the cities like Moscow. So this territory in Bielorussia and Lithuania was uh, majoritarian uh, Jewish. In fact, there's a, uh, a certain uh, percentage of Jewish people listed here in this book that I should mention to you since it is not known. You know, like everybody knows about the Zionist state, right? But people don't know about the Pale of Settlement. They don't know about even Berbizhan. So, let's tell them. Mm -hmm. Not here, no. Where's the percentages? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, my own parents come from eastern uh, Poland. My father from a, a shtetl just outside of Lublin called uh, Bialki which doesn't exist anymore. And my mother from downtown Poland, you know, she was like chic. And uh, of course my father was um, orthodox, you know, somewhat fanatic. My mother was not. And they Yeah, here it is. Okay, hear this out. Hmm. The first systematic census of the Jewish population in the Tsarist Empire was conducted in 1897. It showed that Jews, I use the term Jews, it shows that the Jewish people made up more than 50% of the urban population of Bielorussia and Lithuania. That in Minsk, the city of Minsk, 52% of the population were Jewish. 64% in Bielostok. 41% in Vilnius. And 48% in Grodno. Where's Odessa? we take into account the transition from a type of activity that was principally intermediary in 1918. 86.5% of the Jewish people in Ukraine, Lithuania, and Bielorussia were traders before capitalism. Not bankers, traders. To the new functions promoted by the rise of capitalism, far more differentiated and dominated by manual labor, has completely upset the social and cultural universe of Yiddishland. Second half of the 19th century, in fact, saw the rise of a new Jewish culture in Eastern Europe, a culture that broke with traditional Jewish life in the sense that it was open to the influence of the modern world, seeking to realize the synthesis between modern culture and Jewish values, attacking the formulation of religion and the forms of existence it imposed and drawing its inspiration from the rationalization of the Enlightenment. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
and also becoming a working class, but not the regular working class in the in the big factories, you know, like the low technology working class, you know, like uh, sewing to be tailors, etc. Stuff like that. Okay. So there we have something that is crucial to understanding, you know, how the Jewish people were treated before under the Tsarism and even after the Communist Revolution in the Soviet Union, which did not recognize the Jewish people as a people, did not recognize any collective rights, but recognized the individual rights and protection from anti-Semitism, which was nice. Okay, just nice. Not good enough, though, because it reverted to the anti-Semitic state practices subsequent to the Second World War. In Poland, same thing happened, and there's a second cousin of mine that got expelled from Poland in 1968, even though she was a communist and a radio announcer and all that. And a script writer, she was a um, playwright, a famous playwright, Vaslovsky, and she was expelled. Yeah, after spending her whole life working, you know, for the state. Okay, so let's find out why. I'm going to go back to the reading of the you know, socialist response to anti-Semitism in the German imperial state, which is the foundation of how Jewish people are treated thereafter, in spite of its amelioration under Lenin. Now we go to share here, and we got it. Mehring. Okay, Mehring is big, you know, like one of the earlier theoreticians in the Second International, Social Democratic International. Uh, well, it became the Social Democratic International. But it was the Second International, which included the Marxists of uh, all strikes, both the uh, revisionists, reformists, and the uh, revolutionaries. The First International included more included the anarchists as well. And it's not clear why the First International was destroyed by none other than Marx, it would seem, because he wanted to assert the uh, dominance of the uh, German revolutionary tradition over the French revolutionary tradition. And so they split. How pathetic can you get? Okay. Getting back here to Mehring. Mehring argued Bauer himself had gone out of his way to emphasize that a Jew, as a Jew, could make no contribution to the development of the arts, the sciences, or scholarly endeavors. Why not? Question mark. Because these were activities that transpired in and through history. Let's take a break here. Okay, we can resume now. And we go back to share. And here it is. Okay. Why not? The eternal question. Because these were activities that transpired in through history. Jewelry, as it's called, however, not only stood outside history, it was fundamentally characterized precisely by the fact that its very existence set it against the course of history. Hmm. I've heard something like that before, when some Marxists have referred to the Jewish people as an unhistoric nation, so that it's, it finally became, became known as a nation, but we're supposed to disappear in one way or another. And uh, because uh, we don't fit into history. Which history? Okay, let's find out. The Jew, quote-unquote, led a war of annihilation against history. 
Why is using the word annihilation there? Hmm. Sort of disturbing. Okay. What does he mean by annihilation? In German, it's a Vertigungskrieg. Wow. Vertigungskrieg. It means a, a general war, you know, an all out war. A genocide is, is it's a German word for genocide that precedes the word genocide, even that was invented by Lam Lamkin. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Is that ever powerful? Disastrous. Mehring, supposed to be a socialist. A, hey, Mehring. Okay. The Jew, quote unquote, led a war of annihilation, Vertiglungskrieg, against history. And this war of annihilation, quote unquote, in fact, amounted to a graver crime than the war his ancestors were, requir were required to lead against the Canaanite hordes. What is this Zionist bullshit here? Wow, they believe all this stuff. Oh, probably never read the Torah. Okay. A war of annihilation. Great. <laughs> Jewish people are committing a graver crime than the war his ancestors were required to were required to lead against the Canaanite hordes. Uh, hordes. Oh. Needless to say, Bauer did not conclude this from empirical evidence. <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> Nor from reading the Torah. He posted, posted it, posited it, ah yes, that British word. He posited it by means of a philosophical deduction. To his mind, this philosophical deduction followed self-evidently from the Hegelian scheme of things that we briefly touched on before. As we saw, this scheme of things was based on the assumption that more advanced philosophical and religious systems transcended less advanced ones. Yet the more advanced systems did not simply abolish the previous ones altogether. Rather, the perfectible elements of the previous systems were contained and perfected, aufgehoben, lifted up, in the more advanced ones. It lies in the nature of Hegel's dialectical system that the implications of this line of thought can seem somewhat paradox, paradoxical should be, at first sight. On the one hand, this line of argument implied that the previous systems that had now been superseded were valid, valid in their own time and had contained perfectible elements. On the other hand, it rendered these previous systems doubly obsolete. Not only had they passed their cell by date, what is more, their perfectible elements had now irreversibly become part of the most recent, more advanced system. The Hegelian scheme of things emphasizes both the validity of historical religions and philosophies in their time, then, and their subsequent obsolescence. Hmm, obsolescence. Oh, yes. Well, that's what Marx had planned for the Jewish people, I think. The point here is precisely that these are not alternatives. Instead, one implication cannot be thought without the other. It hardly takes a genius, though, to see how intellectuals subsequently appropriating Hegel's system, especially when embroiled in directly political or polemical debate, rather than lofty philosophical discourse, comma, would be likely to emphasize one of these implications at the expense of the other. When it came to Judaism and the controversy regarding Jewish emancipation, people were generally inclined to pick the notion of Judaism's utter obsolescence from the Hegelian system. The issue of its, of its historical validity, it's, <laughs> it's is referring to the Jewish people, <laughs> the issue of the Jewish people's historical validity and the perfectible elements within it, by contrast, rarely caught anyone's imagination. This certainly holds true for Bruno Bauer. In Hegel's scheme of things, Christianity was the 
ultimate and most advanced religious system. In Bauer's vision, Christianity, in turn, would be superseded by atheism, hmm. another religion. The very existence of post-biblical Judaism was not only an anomaly in the sense that it contradicted the course of historical development, by maintaining its distinct existence, post-biblical Judaism also amounted to an active revolt against the potential perfection of biblical Judaism's perfectible elements, and thus against its very essence. Mm -hmm. Quote, not the daughter, i.e. Christianity, is ungrateful vis-a-vis -vis her mother, i.e. Judaism, Bauer explained. Rather, the mother will not acknowledge her daughter because she represents the true essence of that which went before, and that which went before has lost its true essence once its consequence has appeared. Oh, the consequence is supposed to be Christianity, I guess. If one of them exists, the other does not. Whoa! Okay, that's the rationale for the Holocaust then. Okay. Consequently, Jewry, what a weird term, Jewry. The Jewish people, man. Jewry could not even provide a comprehensive account of its own essence. For in order to do so, it would have to perceive of itself as the precursor of Christianity. To Bauer's mind, it had therefore fallen to none other than Jean Andreas Eisenmenger, 1654 to 1704, to produce a valid account of Judaism's essence. That Hegelian word. Okay. This claim is, but it's true. This claim is, of course, remarkable by any standards. Eisenmenger's Eintdecht. Wow. Ent, entdeckt. Oh, wow, that's the difficult word. Entdeckt. Huh? Juden, Judentum is, after all, indubitably the most influential Judeophobic compendium of the early modern period and has remained a significant source of religious anti-Judaism ever since its first publication in 1700. Bauer added that should there ever be an account superior to Eisenmenger's, the one thing one could be sure of was that it too would not be produced by a Jew. Admittedly, Christians too were impaired in this respect. They too were ultimately incapable of genuine the theoretical and scientific achievements until they finally became atheists. This is Bauer talk. Yet their form of prejudice, befangenite, <laughs> befangenite is like a uh, um, Confucianist, not Confucianist, but con confusion, confusion as a methodology. <laughs> Height means sort of, you know, method. Uh, was none, nevertheless a considerable advance on that of the Jews. Yet their form of prejudice, according to Power was nevertheless a considerable advance on that of the Jews. Uh -huh. While Mehring felt a strong affinity for Kant, with reason, he never seriously engaged Hegel. His discussion of the Hegelian origins of the Marxian project never went beyond a paraphrasing of the pronouncements that Marx and especially Engels themselves had made on the matter. Occasionally, this discussion, in fact, reflected LaSalle's understanding of Hegel more than that of Marx and Engels. Yes, Bauer's categorical denial of the Jews' uh, aptitude for artistic, scientific, or scholarly endeavors obviously struck a strong chord with Mehring's preconceptions, though. Hence, it seems to have given rise to one of the few occasions on which he wholeheartedly took on board a genuine product of Hegelian, though not Hegel's, philosophical labor. Yet what had been a purely philosophical deduction with Hegelian underpinning in Bauer's Die Jugendfrage, 
Meiring now reintroduced as allegedly empirical evidence that neatly bore out his own anti-Jewish sentiments. It would, of course, be silly to suggest that Bauer himself had shed a previously positive or indifferent attitude towards Jewry because he felt compelled by the logical implications of Hegelian thought to adopt a negative one instead. For him too, the Hegelian concept had done no more than offer an opportunity to lend a sense of sophistication, detachment, and necessity to his negative preconceptions. Quote, it may be that our notion of Jewry seems even harsher than the one we have come to expect from the opponents of Jewish emancipation, Bauer explained towards the end of his introduction, as if he were not one of them. <laughs> Quote, it may be that it, it really is, he conceded, and then added, as if he were pained by the need to be so cruel, but had no other choice. But, well, but my only concern can be its veracity, i.e. the veracity of his notion of jury. And how does he know this? Not by any empirical matter, except for popular culture of German Christians. As already suggested, Bauer's case is in many ways typical for what was most likely the prevalent long-term influence of Hegel's thought on Judaism and Jewry. Oh yeah, yeah, that's what I just said. Few are likely ever to have penetrated the intricacies of Hegel's relevant pronouncements anyway. Hegel himself had in fact never come up with a comprehensive solution that genuinely satisfied him and his accounts therefore varied in certain aspects. Little wonder, then, if few others could ultimately make head or tail of the matter. Within Hegel's scheme of things, Judaism was not directly superseded by Christianity. One can imagine how this alone made it far from easy to utilize his system for more common forms of political discourse and polemical purposes. What was catchy, though, and clearly appealed to existing preconceptions was his concept of historical progress with its notion that the religious and philosophical systems that had been superseded were in irredeemably obsolete and that their valid elements were contained in the systems that had superseded them. Okay, let's take a break for here for a petite. Okay, I'm back here. Let's go to share again. Yeah, back on track. Within the parameters of the Enlightenment discourse, the matter had been handled somewhat differently. There, it was claimed that Judaism was a purely revealed or positive religion, positivism. Jews were not allowed to question the rationality of the rules laid down by revelation. Oh, yeah? Hmm. They were duty-bound to adhere to those rules out of obedience, not insight. Judaism was therefore based entirely on unquestioning obedience to a set of catalog of stipulations that expressly disallow, disallowed genuine conviction as a standard by which to measure their validity. Consequently, it was a religion that was structurally incapable of reform. It could not perfect itself and become a religion in which obedience to God and insight into the rationality of God's commands would become one. Christianity, going to Hegel, I suppose, on the other hand, was assumed to be both a revealed and a natural religion. Hence, hence it could go 
where Judaism could not. The assumption was this. God had created a natural ability in human beings to recognize the rationality of his commands. Hence, there could be no real contradiction between God's commands, on the one hand, and what human beings could determine for themselves as the right course of action, on the other. Where human beings had failed in the past to apply this ability in a proper and sufficient manner, God had used revelation as an additional means of communication to help them along the way. In so doing, God had to accommodate himself to the human beings to whom he was revealing himself. Hence, revelation had appealed to human superstition to instill obedience amongst the believers. As human beings became more and more capable of fully applying their rational faculties, however, they would shed all dependence upon superstition as a substitute for rational insight. Instead of doing the right thing out of obedience, they would do it out of inner conviction or indoctrination. Instead of acting in accordance with external stipulations, heteronomy, human beings would be able to determine under their own steam how to act properly in equal accordance with God's wishes and their own interests. Autonomy. For mainstream Enlightenment thinkers, then, Christianity was on a path of reform and perfection from revolution to natural insight, from obedience to conviction, from heteronomy to autonomy. For Judaism, none of this was possible. Jews had nothing to go by than an externally stipulated catalog of rules that they were bound to adhere to out of obedience, not insight. Hmm. This was a qualitative judgment that could, in theory, be unraveled. Assuming one could conclusively prove that Judaism was not as immutably tied to its initial revelation as its critics claimed, and hence perfectible after all, the whole issue of Judaism's alleged inferiority would have to be revisited. In an important sense, the Jewish reform movements set out to achieve just that. The Hegelian model by contrast, rendered this option impossible even in theory. Judaism was obsolete. Whatever perfectible elements might once have in, inhered in it were now being perfected elsewhere. Clearly, this offered a watertight case. That history obviously could not be turned back went without saying. For most, oh yes, this is a concept of progress, Yes, uh, otherwise known in, in uh, political theory or political philosophy, in my thesis actually, as linear periodization. You know, like cause effect in the old uh, classical physics scientific method, which is obsolete now actually. For most participants in these debates, history and progress were one, and the suggestion that history could be reversed would have amounted to claiming that time itself could be turned back. Uh -huh. Within the scheme of things, nothing that might be presented in defense or praise of original pre-obsolescent Judaism could claim to underscore the legitimacy of a continued distinct Jewish existence. Hmm. Let us return to Mehring's account in his introduction to Zerjudenfrage. Quote, the emancipatory struggle of the young Hegelians against Christianity could not, of course, transpire without Judaism too being criticized, he explained. Now, in and of itself, this is a perfectly valid point. A priori, there is no reason why a general critique of religion should be any more sparing in its dealings with Judaism than it is in its approach to any other religion. This Argument only holds, though, when critics of religion actually criticize all religions in equal measure, with equal emphasis, and talking about the same thing. However, one of the problems in this particular historical context is this. 
young Hegelians were constantly radicalizing their critique of religion. As they did so, they increasingly applied criticisms or negative stereotypes that had previously been associated specifically with Judaism to religion in general and or to Christianity. Yet, within the Hegelian scheme of things, this much was clear. As the religion of the day, Christianity had to be the most advanced religion. However, critique-worthy it might be on its own terms. The young Hegelians had to be able to explain what set the two religions apart and what rendered Judaism inferior to Christianity. Since they had now already used most of the critical ammunition that previous generations had used to assault Judaism, to shoot at Christianity and religion in general, they were fishing ever near the bottom of the barrel for reasons to maintain that Judaism was inferior to Christianity. <laughs> Consequently, their critical arguments, quote unquote, against Judaism tended to become more and more extravagant and injurious. Hmm. Nothing would hold them back, huh? Against this background, Mayering's contention that this unavoidable critique of Judaism had been undertaken, quote, in a perfectly historical way, oh, unquote, i.e., based on sound historical research, is simply laughable. To Mayering's mind, the way in which Feuerbach had, quote, analyzed Judaism as a religion of practical egoism, quote, unquote, was, was a good example for this kind of, quote, perf perfect, perfectly historical, unquote, research. Hmm. By contrast, quote, the Nuremberg professor Daumer had applied somewhat cruder instruments, unquote, Mayering conceded. But ultimately, even he he had made a valid contribution to the necessary critique of religion that just could not avoid criticizing Judaism too, and foremost. One might have been forgiven for assuming that it was a little unusual, to say the least, to want to rehabilitate Bauer, despite the fact that Marx had rejected his stance so emphatically. That Mehring was now intent on finding redeeming features, even in Daumer's Judeophobic obsession with blood cults, and human sacrifice, though, is clearly a faux pas of a totally different order of magnitude. Hmm. None too surprisingly, all this quote-unquote perfectly historical and unavoidable criticism of Judaism had provoked a Jewish response. These quote-unquote Jewish lamentations had been entirely, quote-unquote, fatuous, but one did have to concede, Meyering admitted, that the young Hegelians had not only failed to explain, quote, how Judaism had been able to survive for so long alongside Christianity, unquote, they had also failed to explain, quote, how it, that is Judaism, could be overcome, unquote. At this point, quote, the decisive step was only undertaken by Marx, unquote. Aha, uh -huh. so that's what he appreciates Marx for. Mehring then went on to emphasize the significance and merits of the Judenfrage. It was certainly well suited to refute false accusations that leading anti-Semites had leveled at Marx. You know, at this point, the decisive step was only undertaken by Marx, yes, I've heard this argument made by other Marxists that Marx was qualitatively better than Bauer and that he was actually sort of defending the Jewish people. Well, <laughs> well, Marx only defended the Jewish people to call for the uh, cancellation of the Jewish people. He defended the Jewish people saying that the Jewish people were cancelable. That's how I view it. Okay, let's continue. Mehring went on to emphasize the significance and merits of Zer Judenfrag. Oh, yeah. It was certainly well suited to refute false accusations that leading anti Semites had leveled on Marx. Quote, 40 years after the publication of this text by Marx, Mehring explained, the imperial court preacher Stocker and Professor Wagner rolled the filthy handkerchief 
of reactionary anti-Semitism as their banner and traveled through the land trying to persuade the workers, gagged by socialistic gesenst, a socialist spirit, sort of, that the Jew Marx had indeed attacked the industrious and diligent manufacturers, but never the Jewish usurers. It would be a pity were this glorious triumph of Christian Germanic truthfulness ever forgotten. Holy As we heard before, Mehring felt strongly that the historical concept of the Jewish question presented in Zera Judenfrage deserved to become the common intellectual property of the modern working class. He concluded his introduction to Zera Judenfrage by remarking that this concept admittedly beats the life out of liberal philo-Semitism, but it is precisely that which makes it the most effective antidote to reactionary anti-Semitism. Hmm. Mehring attempts to rehabilitate Bauer were not limited to his introduction to Zerjudenfrage. He even managed to sneak in an anti-philosemitic remark in support of Bauer into his introduction in the Heilige Family. As we saw, Marx emphasized in the Heilige Family that Bauer had not got the better of his Jewish critics, even though he was essentially the superior polemicist. Mehring reiterated this, adding that one could well understand the contempt Bauer expressed vis-à-vis -vis the discourse prevalent in the mid-1840s. Bauer's complaint, Mehring explained, had been this. On the one hand, quote, the Jewish spokesman called for the authorities to silence the critics of Judaism. On the other hand, the Christian well, the Christ, Christian Germanic rowdies saw quote unquote, Jewish money behind every broom that threatened to infringe, infringe on their rot and decay and raved wildly, wildly that, quote, the Jews have usurped almost the entire press. <laughs> Sounds familiar. Against this background, one can well understand Bauer's declaration of despair. Quote, what an ill-fated struggle this is when both sides resort to such empty rhetoric and denunciations. Quote. Bauer had been justified in his critique, but he had drawn a fallacious conclusion from the state of affairs. Bauer had assumed that the, quote, empty rhetoric and denunciations, unquote, signaled the imminent exhaustion of both parties. Here, Bauer had been mistaken. Quote, he was to live just long enough, unquote, Mehring then added rather ominously, quote, to see that this delightful rhetorical tit-for-tat was still as alive in the 80s as it was in the 40s, unquote. To the uninitiated reader, this formulation surely suggests that Bauer happened to live long enough to be able to observe the polemics between anti-Semites and philo-Semites, following the emergence of modern political anti-Semitism in the late 1870s. Yet, as Mehring knew only too well, Bauer was, of course, no mere observer of the emergence of modern political anti-Semitism. During the final year of his life, Bauer had stood at the helm of an aggressively anti-Semitic journal. Hmm. Schmeitzner's International Monatschrift, Monatschrift. Hmm. But Bauer was not only a direct participant in the emerging anti-Semitic movement. He had also played a substantial role in the intervening decades, preparing the ideological ground for this development. In a short note on the occasion of Bauer's death in 1882, Ludwig Philipsschen, 1811-1899, the editor of the Allgemeine Zeitung der Judenzum, Judentums, even called him the actual father of anti-Semitism. Hmm. Perhaps his most important contribution had been his article on Jewry in Wagner's uh, Staatsengesellschaft Lexicon. In this article, Bauer had taken the position that, to quote, Rottenstreich went 
quote, far beyond the boundaries of contemporary conservative thought, unquote, on the Jewish question. Particularly significant in this context was the article's emphasis on the racial aspect and its special application to the Jews. The stance Bauer articulated in this article was hence, quote, indicative of a new stage in the discussion of the Jewish problem and signaled a, quote, significant evolution of anti-Jewish and anti-emancipationist thought, unquote. We might add that it would have been easy for those interested in the matter to establish how Bauer's position in Wagner's Statzen Gesellschaft lexicon compared to the most conventional conservative stance. For Wagner himself had published the classic formulation of this more conventional stance only five years earlier in his Das Juden in der Stadt. Uh, the, uh, the, in, in that, <laughs> to translate that, you'd have to sort of, the, uh, Jude, the, uh, Judaism, <laughs> Judaism, the Jew, the, the Jewish existence or the Jet, the Jewish, the Jewish thing and the state. This makes it all the more remarkable that Wagner and his conservative brackers apparently genuinely failed to recognize the originality of Bauer's position. Admittedly, Bauer's article in Wagner's Staten Gesellschaft Lexicon was not signed. Yet we know for sure that Mehring, for one, knew exactly who the article's author was. In May 1893, Max Schippel uh, published excerpts from his article in the Night Sight, New Times, without realizing that Bauer was the author. On the 7th of June, Mehrings promptly informed Kautsky that Schippel, Schippel is wrong. Incidentally, if he attributes the articles on Jewry in Wagner's lexicon to the East Albion Junkerdom, the aristocracy of Prussia, basically. No, that reactionary view, they are by Bruno Bauer. Yes, apparently Kautsky was not aware of Bauer's authorship of the article either. He replied on 12th of June that he found Mehring's information on the matter very interesting. As we saw, Bauer's position went beyond the conventional conservative approach towards the Jewish question. In the sense, Mehring's remark that Bauer's stance and that of the East Albion Junkerdom could not simply be lumped together was an important sense of a valid observation. But how likely is it that this was Mehring's reason for wanting to distinguish between Bauer and the conservatives? Far more likely is this. Mehring felt that Bauer deserved to be singled out because he still stood above the prevalent his rhetorical tit-for-tat then, as he had done in the 1840s, whatever else one might want to say about or against him. All this raises two critical questions. Why, firstly, did Mehring go to such lengths to formulate his appreciation for Bauer and credit Marx with his own anti-philosemitism in this obviously untenable way. Secondly, how consciously disingenuous was he in doing so? Take Wistrich's contention that Mehring was effectively construing Zer Judenfrage as an alibi for his own anti-Jewish sentiments and preoccupations, no, preconceptions. If Wistrich was suggesting that this was a conscious act on Mehring's part, this notion would utterly depend on two basic premises. Firstly, it would presuppose that proof texts by Marx and Engels were absolutely central to Mehring's sense of what could and could not be argued legitimately. Consequently, he would have consistently sought to cover his back by taking recourse to such proof texts. At the same time, he would have been highly reluctant to criticize them, even when he was in fact at odds with them. Secondly, would presuppose that anti philosemitism Mehring, was wrongly crediting Marx with was actually a marginalized position in the party. If not, why would he need an alibi? To my mind, neither of these presumptions is tenable. To be sure, Mehring loved to dwell on his affinity to Marx and Engels. As we saw, the trust placed in him by individuals closely associated with Marx and Engels was important to a sense of legitimacy and he conspicuously basked in their praise when he received it. Yet one of the hallmarks of his entire party career 
career was his determination to take on party mess and question the canonized accounts of the party's historical and ideological development. He clearly had no qualms whatsoever about publicly contradicting Marx or Engels, if that was what he thought it took. The most obvious illustration of this was his sympathetic treatment of La Salle, and in part even of Schweitzer. In this context, he persistently maintained that Marx and Engels, for all the superiority in the lofty heights of ideological discourse, had lost touch with the realities on the ground. Yet it was for these realities that La Salle had been just the man. Another example in the way in which in the Nachlaschlob, he adopted Rosa Luxemburg's stance on the Polish question and used his introduction there to explain why the position Marx and Engels had taken on the matter could no longer be upheld. He almost willfully iconic classic approach to accept the Dom doctrines and traditions embroiled him in numerous conflicts. It is hardly a coincidence that the pretext leading to his de facto removal from the Naya site in 1913 sprang from a renewed controversy in which he had criticized Marx and Engels' assessment of La Salle as profound, profoundly misguided. If Mehring had no qualms about setting Marx straight on other occasions, why should he have chosen intentionally to misrepresent him in this particular instance? If he could say that Marx got his evaluation of the cell or the Polish question wrong, why should he have hesitated to say Marx should have been more anti philo -Semitic? It would only make sense to suggest that he really did feel the need to cover his back in this particular instance if he had reason to assume that his anti philosemitism broke a radical taboo in the party, hmm. one that was far more closely guarded than the official position, say, on the merits and faults of LaSalle. Mm -hmm. Yet, as we saw, there was no such taboo. Particularly outspoken and vitriolic mayorings, anti philosemitism may have been in a way unusual or frowned upon by his peers, it was not. This really only leaves us with one possible conclusion. Mehring was in fact perfectly convinced that he portrayed matters correctly in his introductions to Zaryudin Faga in the Heilige family. Okay, let's take a break here. So this is uh, part 12, I think it is. Okay, stopping the share, because it's Shabbos, sundown. Okay, now for Shabbos, we light the candles. Okay. And here it is. Here's the Shabbos candelabra. Let's see now, like, I can get it in. It's a bit too close there. Yeah. Okay. Let's see how far. Mm -hmm. No. Uh. Okay, let's get this stuck in. Seriously, so that it won't fall over and start a fire. Okay. Baruch atah Adonai. Eloheinu melech haolam. Hadlik Nech Shabbos. Nice one. Yeah. There. There it is.
Okay, it's Chavez. Okay, see you next week. Bye for now, and that was a reading, part 11, I believe, of the uh, Lars Fisher book and study published by Cambridge University Press on socialist response to anti-Semitism in the German imperial state, specifically during the Second International and the discussion amongst the Marxists. It's essential reading interpretation essential for the left to come to grips with this and get serious about national identity as opposed to nationalism the two are opposed to each other nationalism is zionism national identity is bundism simply put good night lots mir leben zu einem mit zeichel shit wissen zu schulen okay that's Yiddish, not an obsolete language. <laughs>